Hey YouTube, Mr. Terry back here once again to check out another history video. I had recommended me another video by Oversimplified, this one on the American Revolution, so we'll go ahead and check this out. Alright, as always, uh, when I do a reaction video, I would uh, really appreciate if you would go to the original video, uh, which a link will be below to make sure they get your... Um, likes and views and things like that it's important that these content creators know that uh, people support them so they make more of them and um, these videos are so great just to expose people to basic historical concepts and things like that so um, be sure to do that as well okay um, after the video if, if uh, you would like to uh, suggest another video uh, make sure you do that down in the comments below and i'll try to get to it but let's go ahead and check out oversimplified the american revolution part one Holy smokes. Christopher Columbus, that is no way to address the king and queen of Spain. What is wrong with you? Okay, okay, so you know how we're looking for a new trade route to India, right? Right. And the earth is round, right? Right. So I'm thinking we can just sail the other way around the planet, right? Yeah. So I set sail, right? Mm -hmm. And I reach India, right? Right. Wrong. Wrong. I did not reach India. I did not. All right. No. All right. Get to the point. Did you know? There's a whole nother freaking continent out there. Okay, and you think I should care about this? Why? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I forget to mention there's gold everywhere? Gold? <laughs> Columbus landed in central... Now, from what I understood, though, you know, Columbus makes a, a few trips to the Americas. Um, I was under the impression, I could be wrong, that he always thought he was in Asia somewhere, that it wasn't necessarily this new continent, whatever whatever they mean by here, whether it's just not mainland Asia. Um, but I was under the pressure, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, that he basically went to his death thinking he had reached somewhere in Asia. Um, but that was a pressure I had, but I, of course, could be wrong there. So feel free to correct me. Central America in October 1492, and he had the time of his life. And by that I mean he went on a huge theft and murder spree. He stole gold, jewelry, people, and a hammock. Tiny and then he people. returned to show off all people of his riches, including with. a few previously undiscovered items, such as tobacco, the pineapple, turkeys, and a hammock. Now I know what you're thinking, but oversimplified, Columbus didn't discover America, the Vikings did. And you'd be partially right. In the 11th century, Leif Erikson was the first European- Are we ignoring the fact that millions of people already live there? So, you can't really discover something if- millions of people are already there but they mean discovered by europeans of course maybe we're just talking semantics there but yep got to give credit to the vikings and to land in america but hey if you love vikings so much then why don't you check out today's sponsor vikings war of clans is a mobile game got that it. was inspired by the famous strategy and rpg games of the 90s <laughs> like Age of um, i'll definitely let the ad run here do you like um, building cities here, collecting so resources the training armies people can joining a clan and going give credit to, war? to their then sponsors my friends, so vikings war yeah i mean when you go back to american you. history and what back makes its to, world so addictive I mean, is that more than 20 million everything online such a players are constantly changing the way the game everything is by never ending fighting over resources forging new alliances and competing in live events trying to get to asia of course by downloading vikings for free only for my links in the description box below and get the special bonus like of 200 gold coins to find and a protective shield. Don't forget to look like me up and join well, my Vikings clan Spain under my nickname, Oversimplified. Of, uh, now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Basically, still Columbus, fighting the Crusades time of his life, and trying to find ways hammock. to And suddenly, the race that, was on so to explore and conquer anyway. the New World. After a couple centuries of warring with the natives and each other, the European powers had claimed quite a lot of land, including this area, which both the English and the French claimed as theirs. One Ohio. day, the French said, I'm going to build some forts along here. And the English were like, could you not? And the French said, sorry, but no, I could not not. And they went ahead and built their forts, which pissed off the English. So they sent an up-and-coming British lieutenant colonel by the name of George Washington with a combined force of British troops and Native Americans. After a short battle, the French commander said, all right, all right, we surrender. Okay, boys, pack it up. They're surrender. Oh, sorry, was I not meant to split his head open with a tomahawk? Ah, don't worry. It's not like this will start a seven-year-long major global conflict. And what happened next was a seven-year-long major global conflict, which Great Britain won. At the peace negotiations, Spain gave... Yeah, it's a long story short. Seven years war, you could honestly almost make a case that the seven years war is the first world war because it was fought on many continents in the Americas. Um, so, I mean, in the Western Hemisphere, all over the place, in Asia, back home, multiple nations were involved. You know, it was the United States and France, who's United States and their allies versus uh, France and their, uh, and their allies with the United States. United States, I meant Britain, sorry, Britain and France, um, with Britain and France being the two major powers, and here in the 1700s, because the mid-1700s, are the two biggest colonial powers in the world, and the world is kind of a big chessboard that they're all trying to um, take 
you know, portions of. So you got this uh, collision of imperial ambitions here in the West, in America, as you can see. You got it back in India, which is probably the really crown jewel of this whole conflict in general. But yeah, you get these two and they are going to just um, go all in with this and uh, basically bankrupt their nations, um, which you will see, I'm sure they're going to bring up here. But yeah, the Seven Years' War is one of the most important conflicts in modern history as it is the result of it is basically the reason if you're an american like me that why you're speaking english right now you know what i mean the, there are so many different outcomes um that could have happened you know had it not gone the way and then the short story of course is uh, the british win this war so that's going to solidify a lot of british dominance around the world Gave up Florida, while well, France gave up all of its territories in North America. But Britain's victory came at a cost, a 60 million pound cost. They were now broke, in a lot of debt, and had to come up with win, some way to repay it. So broke. they went to the colonies and said, okay, listen up. So a huge part of the war was spent protecting you from the French, and now we have no money because of it. So... Taxes. I'm not sure what you're saying here. Okay, so we spent a lot of money protecting you from the French, right? Right. And now we're broke. So. That certainly is a pickle. Listen to me. <laughs> We spent all of our money protecting you, and now we need money. Yeah, so? Can you please pay us back some money? No. Okay, we're just gonna go ahead and tax you. In 1764, Britain introduced the Sugar Act, Gun forcing the, the colonists to import sugar and molasses exclusively from the British and to pay duties on them. Then a year later, they introduced the extremely controversial Stamp Act, and it worked a little something like this. Hello, shopkeep. Hello, Mr. Bungleberry. Here's the deed for your new shack. Stamp. That'll be three pence, please. Wait, what was that? It's the new tax. I get a stamp on any paper or documentation I make, and you have to pay for it. Would you like to see this pamphlet that explains everything? Yes, please. Okay. Stamp. Two <laughs> pence, please. This is awful. You know what? Just give me a deck so I can go gamble honest. my pain away. Okay. No. Basically any printed thing. Even, yeah, cards. Don't do it. <laughs> stamp. <laughs> Obviously, the colonists were like, Hey, my dudes, this new tax legislation right here, this is BS. <laughs> Until now, they had enjoyed relative freedom to rule themselves, and now suddenly Britain Seven was asserting its control. They were especially unhappy because they didn't have any representatives in the parliament that was levying taxes on them. So they protested. Orators gave fire... That is a key thing to understand. Um, the Americans were not necessarily, or at least how they... Like, nobody wants to pay taxes. I mean, it's just how people are. But the main quarrel that the Americans cited was not the fact that you had these taxes. I mean, the British could easily justify them by saying, hey, you're part of our empire, and people back in England actually get taxed at a far higher rate than people in the colonies like like in America. And uh, But that was not necessarily the things the Americans were saying was their biggest gripe. It was the fact that these taxes are being created in Parliament back in, um, uh, back in Britain, but there is no representation uh, from the colonies in that government now if they had given because this brings another question if there was representation in parliament would there still be this justification for what's going to happen with the revolution i don't know i mean it's not like there would probably be a ton of representatives from the americas in parliament but i don't know it would have changed i guess what the americans would say is of a justification but you gotta think big picture too i mean the, the the colonists feel more and more disconnected from britain as it's now the mid 1700s and people have been coming for decades upon decades and feeling less and less connected back home but so there's a lot of different things at stake here but the whole taxation without representation thing of course is the thing that's going to be the most publicized and try to be the the thing that they feel is the most uh, the americans is the most fair ground to have an objection against all of this. British goods were boycotted, and anyone loyal to the British found themselves increasingly harassed. The whole thing actually began to take quite a toll on British business, and after just a couple years, the British were forced to repeal the Stamp Act. But we still desperately need money. What should we do? We could try taxing the colonies. Great idea. We're Wait, didn't that. we literally just try that and it failed miserably? Man, look at me. <laughs> I look fabulous. Have you ever seen such a handsome boy? No sorry, Georgie. No King way. George. You're the handsomest, smartest, most popular king that ever lived, and everybody likes you. You're doing such a good <laughs> job. But your majesty? Oh, you're still here. Get the hell out. So in <laughs> 1766, the British made a declaration saying, we can do what we want because we're in charge and you can all go suck it. Then they levied a whole bunch of new taxes on the Americans via import duties. Glass? There's a tax for that. Lead? There's a tax for that. Paper? Tea? Oil? There's a tax for that. And once again, the Americans boycotted British goods, British business felt the pinch, and the British had to back down. Yeah, the, the, 
the obvious thing to do is okay the the britain is powerful right and they can try to enforce things enforce these taxes make sure these pay these taxes but the move that the you know the protesters in america said is well then what we need to do is if we can't control what taxes are coming in just stop buying the stuff that is taxed right there's rules you know and laws that the united states can only really do business with the british uh, which is a different story because that brought in piracy and tries ways to try to get around it. But simply stop buying the British goods um, because the way in this era, if you want to hit the hit the British, um, hit them hardest is to hit them in their wallet, right? Stop buying their goods so they don't get the taxes. And as you saw, that did make a big impact um, as revenue was decreasing at this time, and the British were very well aware of it. So they're going to have to take another strategy. Uh, to try to get this revenue. All right, this is ridiculous. They're my colonies, and I have to be able to assert my control. Repeal all the new taxes except for the one on tea. Also send 1,000 troops to Boston to take control. Oh, and make the colonists pay for them. And as British troops arrived, the tension in Boston was palpable. You Boston could cut it with a knife, city and it was America. all about to come to a head. On March 5th, a band of local patriots began heckling a British guard at the Customs House. More and more Americans joined in the heckling, while more British troops turned up in support of their comrade. Snowballs were thrown at the British. The snowballs turned to rocks, the rocks to oyster shells. The soldiers, outnumbered, panicked. One thing leads to another, and you can see where this is going. Boston Massacre. Five civilians were killed. The Patriot press throughout the colonies declared the Boston Massacre an unwarranted crime committed against the people of Boston by the cruel British, and the anger continued to grow. A British revenue schooner that ran... The Boston Massacre was so well publicized. Um, this famous picture right here was by uh, one of the richest men and most influential men in Boston, Paul Revere, you've probably heard of, who gave it its name, if you can see up here, uh, probably can't see very well, but The Bloody Massacre. Right. And, and uh, intentionally, of course, try to make this look really, really bad and aggressive for the British with what five people die. Probably the least massacre massacre ever. Uh, not to downplay the, the fatalities there, but um, was definitely uh, publicized in a way to try to get more and more sympathy towards uh, this, these protests. And Boston is is the battleground here is the most important city in America. It's the busiest port and uh, the most important for sure the people of Boston by the cruel British, and the anger continued to grow. A British revenue schooner that ran aground in Rhode Island was burned by the locals. When it came to light that the governor of Massachusetts supported the suppression of the colonists, his house was burned by the locals. And next, the colonists would set their sights on the remaining tax on tea. On December 16th, 1773, a band of patriots known as the Sons of Liberty disguised themselves as Native Americans, marched down to Boston Harbor, boarded a British merchant ship loaded with tea, and in front of thousands of spectators, threw nearly 10,000 pounds worth of party right? overboard. The British were disgusted, and they punished Massachusetts <laughs> with a vengeance. They dissolved yep. its General Assembly, revoked their charter, and sent 3,000 more troops to occupy the city, meaning Boston and Massachusetts were now essentially under... The Boston Tea Party was not a small little thing, too, as far as um, damages. I mean, it, it would be, I think, if I've, I've seen the, the data on it, um, would be equivalent, I think, of maybe multi-millions of dollars um, in, in destruction of tea, which was a lot. I mean, people love their tea here in the uh you know uh, mid 1700s so it was not just a little thing i mean it 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 was uh very destructive with with how much uh was lost as far as um value of that tea so you can see the british responded very you know abruptly and want to be even more assertive in their control over here the direct rule of great britain and oh boy, were the people pissed. All the other, other colonies saw what was happening and worried they might be next. So they called a brain trust to decide what to do. 56 delegates from 12 colonies gathered and met in Philadelphia at the First Continental Congress. And the roll call read like a who's who of America's finest thinkers. I'm talking lawyers extraordinaire Johnny A and Johnny J, experienced military commander George Washington, businessman and future alcoholic beverage Samuel Adams, <laughs> fiery orator Patty H. Guy who married a rich lady, Big J Dickinson. And while they weren't present at the first Congress, soon names like James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and much later Alexander Hamilton would all serve time in the Continental Congress. The question now, though, was what to do about the British. After much bitter debate and disagreement, they eventually agreed on an amazing solution. They would simply ask the British to stop. Can you stop? No. It didn't work. Okay, then tell the local militias to start arming and be ready at a minute's notice. And across the colonies, these Minutemen stood ready for the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. 
Now, having your colonies in open rebellion is one thing. Once they start arming themselves, that's when it really hits the fan. So British General Thomas Gage ordered 700 troops from Boston out into the rebel-controlled Massachusetts countryside to destroy stores of arms and ammunition held by the rebels in Concord. The British set out in the middle of the night. Patriots, including Paul Revere, rode ahead to warn that the British were coming, giving the rebels time to prepare. So when my tech startup needed a new logo, I went Bad to Fiverr and got one. It's simple. Just search, just click, too bad. and you're done. Bad here, but... Logo ordered. And that's how you get the two sides met in Lexington as the sun began to rise. They faced off against each other, and in the confusion, somebody shot first. The shot heard around the world marked the beginning of the American War of First Independence. Battle of the rebels were outnumbered and had to fall back to Concord as the British split up to search for rebel supplies. However, more and more Patriot rebels kept showing up, and this time it was the British who were outnumbered as more fighting kicked off in Concord. The most professional army in the world was forced to flee back to Boston at the hands of local, poorly trained militiamen. And all along the British were back to Boston, the Patriot world. rebels continued to gather and open fire on the retreating British. When the British reached Boston, the rebel militia surrounded them. Boston and the British were now under siege as small land and naval skirmishes continued around the city. And the British would suffer another embarrassing blow, this time in upstate New York. Colonel Benedict Arnold concocted a plan to take the British stronghold Fort Ticonderoga, which held a large amount of guns and ammunition. He set off towards the fort alone, hoping to recruit men along the way, when he came across the Green Mountain Boys, led by Ethan Allen, who as it turned out, had the exact same plan he did. So they decided to work together. But I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm Arnold's in charge. No, I'm in charge. No, I'm in charge. This went on for some Throughout time, this, until uh, the Green Mountain Boys threatened to go home, and Arnold revolution. had to concede. The group raided the fort at night while the Redcoats were asleep, and they caught them completely by surprise, taking the fort and all of its munitions with almost no resistance. Wow, great job, Ethan. Very impressive. By the way, what happened to that other guy we sent to take the fort? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. <laughs> What. The. F Nobody knew what was going on. The colonies were in open rebellion, and for now, they even seemed to be winning. So King George fired General Gage, replaced him with General William Howe, and ordered the rebellion to be put down immediately. Okay, the British are definitely going to retaliate for all of this, so we should probably put together a proper army. First, we need to pick a commander-in-chief, and I think we can all agree that that job should go to the man, Fine. the myth, Anyone the with legend, experience. George Washington. My friends, I am humbled and honored that you would consider me for such an important role. I did not expect for this All break. right, you've been showing up in a military uniform every day for the last 10 <laughs> months. We all know you wanted this, so cut the crap, George. Dude. Uncool. So Washington began his journey up to Boston to take command of the newly established Continental Army, just as the British made their first major attempt to break the siege. They made plans to take the high ground on Bunker Hill, but spies warned the Continentals of the British plans, so they fortified Bunker Hill and set up defensive positions on nearby Breed's Hill. The day of the battle came, and as the British advanced, a barrage of Continental gunfire was opened up on them. Twice they tried to climb the hill, twice they were pushed back. The battle lasted three hours until the Continentals finally ran out of ammunition and had to retreat, allowing the British to take the hill. While technically a British victory, well, they, they suffered nearly 1,000 casualties to the Continentals 400. The colonists showed the British that this wasn't just a rebellion, it was war, and they were ready for it. But one thing they weren't sure about was why they were fighting. While some radicals were starting to throw around the I-word, most hoped to eventually repair their relationship yeah. with Great Britain. So they sent a letter yeah, to King George saying, Hey man, looks like things aren't going your way. Remove the taxes and let's be friends. I'm gonna kick your ass. Send that to the colonies. Your Majesty, your handwriting is terrible. <laughs> Are you sure? Just do it. What does it say? Heard He's it gonna the olive branch. lick my Gross. So for the <laughs> remainder of the year, small engagements continued to occur around the colonies. The British burned down the towns of Falmouth, Massachusetts, and Norfolk, Virginia as revenge for earlier anti-British incidents. These actions played right into the hands of Patriot propaganda. Overseas, the British were seen as brutes, and the French and Spanish would soon begin sending supplies to the rebel cause. During this time, there was also minor fighting going on between Patriot and Loyalist militias. Very in important to not gloss over the support that the Americans are starting to get, right? Especially from countries that had been at war recently with with England um, you got the Spanish and of course by far the French right the French had lost the seven years war and I'm sure anything they could do to stick it to their old enemy would be very very beneficial so you're going to start to see this um, start to see uh, you know the, the, some of these foreign countries um, help the Americans not even necessarily just to help the Americans and some whatever motive but you know they're going after a former enemy so anytime you can you know help there i guess that's that's good at this time so you see that going on and that's of course with the royal family what you're going to see with the french and i'm sure they'll get to it is the public 
right? Is like, why are we giving this stuff to this conflict overseas that we have nothing to do with? And we have all of our own issues, right? Foreshadow the French Revolution, of course. Um, we'll see if they get to that, but that is going to have an, a, um, an indirect effect on uh, the conditions for the French Revolution later on. In the southern colonies. Benedict Arnold was still on a mission to win some personal glory for himself, so he headed up an attempt to invade Canada in a two-pronged attack. The Continentals managed to capture some British forts and the city of Montreal, but a harsh snowstorm with some smallpox on the side saw them defeated and pushed back at Quebec City, and they were forced to retreat all the way to Fort Ticonderoga. Speaking of which, remember all those guns and ammunition? Well, this guy's got a plan for what to do with them. He uses oxen to drag 120,000 pounds of artillery for two months through the harsh winter, 300 miles all the way to Washington and his continental army surrounding Boston. Boom. Washington's got himself some big guns. Which is fortunate, because up until now his army had been suffering through the cold winter, not knowing when the siege would end. Now, they could make a move. Washington wanted to launch a full assault on the city, but his junior officers felt the British were too fortified, and to his credit, Washington was great at hearing and taking on board the ideas of others. Instead, the Continentals worked through the night setting the guns up on Dorchester Heights overlooking the city, and when dawn broke and the British saw the guns, they knew they were toast. Their positions were completely exposed. It was checkmate. They had no choice but to abandon the city. 120 ships carried 9,000 redcoats and 2,000 loyalists away to an unknown fate, and Washington had his first victory of the war. Washington then moved his army to New York, knowing that so when the far. British returned, they would probably land there. In the meantime, a friendly looking old man by the name of Thomas Paine had written and published a pamphlet called Common Sense, in which he advocated for total independence from Great Britain. It spread across the colonies like wildfire. And to this day... You're getting... Because he's British, Thomas Paine. Um, you're getting, like, support from some of the British, right, civilians for this. A lot of them see that this is just like a lost cause, right? That these people, the Americans, want to be independent. You know, let them go. So when you start hearing that perspective from overseas, that's going to fuel you... Fuel you... Fuel you... <laughs> Um, even more. Yeah, Common Sense was a, a bestseller, but basically, yeah, supporting the Americans um, in their independence movement. So you could see support is definitely getting towards the American and probably uh, towards the Americans. And probably most importantly, slowly uh, public support back in Britain is slowly going to start to decrease. And one thing we know about history is it is very difficult, if not almost impossible, to win a war without public support. Day remains the best-selling title in America. It was read aloud in taverns and meeting halls and brought the idea of independence into the mainstream. Congress began to seriously consider the idea. Maybe Thomas Jefferson was selected to write up an official declaration of independence, and he went hard, writing that all men are created equal, with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, Jefferson had over a hundred slaves, but we don't have to talk about that. On the 2nd of July, Took Congress voted Mark. unanimously in favor of independence, and John Adams declared that the 2nd of July would go down as the most remembered day in American history. Then a couple days later, independence actually came into effect. The United States of America was born. There was no turning back now. The Americans tore down a statue of King George in New York and melted him down into 42,000 musket bowls. To the British, it was treason. And if the king had his way, Washington and all of Congress would be hung. Speaking of the British, guess who's back? The king sent an intimidating force of 130 warships and 25,000 men to Huge New York. Armada. Washington knew that taking on the most powerful military in the world wouldn't be easy. The British set up camp on Staten Island as the Americans dug into the defensive Americans positions around Navy. Brooklyn Heights, waiting for an attack to come. But the British just waited, wearing down their opponent's nerve while building their own strength. At one point, they launched a big scary artillery barrage and then said, you know, if I was you right now, I'd probably sue for peace. But Washington told them to shove it. The Americans kept holding out for what was coming, and when they finally hit, they hit hard. 15,000 British troops approached the American position, and the two sides fired on each other in massive rows. But what the Americans didn't realize was they were only fighting a decoy. The main British force was going around to flank the Americans from behind, and when they arrived, they inflicted heavy casualties. The Americans panicked and retreated back to Brooklyn Heights, where they then found themselves trapped between the British army and the river. It looked as though the war was already lost, but luckily, instead of attacking, the British decided to dig in for a siege, and then a thick fog set in, allowing Washington's army to escape across the river unimpeded. Very the British fortunate. continued to chase and engage the Americans off Manhattan, and the Americans suffered defeat after defeat after defeat. It was a disaster. Washington's leadership was called into question, as thousands of American POWs were left to rot as traitors. Washington's army fled through New Jersey, all the way down Rural to conditions. Pennsylvania. Rarely had an army been so badly beaten, yet survived to fight another day. All right. Okay, great. Another video. Um, you can see in these early years, the Americans were not doing well in the war. 
Um, it was not going very well. Very few victories uh, at this time. But there's a, a topic that I've talked about in my classes before, something to think about with this, and it's it's kind of this question about strategies. And asking the students, who benefits more from this war going on longer? And gotten opinions on both sides. Some say the British, just for the fact that they can have more resources and that sort of thing uh, to outlast them. And some say the Americans, because um, one thing that was already being shown is that maybe the longer this goes on, the more it helps Americans as far as making this war less and less popular. The, the longer this war goes on, uh, more British people will lose faith in this war and start to see maybe the American perspective. But you could probably make a case on both sides. But usually what I've heard is, you know, the longer this goes on, maybe that helps the Americans in a way. So that's hard to say, though, or hard to um, think about at this moment because things are not going very well for the Americans here are going to have to find some other ways. And one of the things you're going to see, I'm sure in part two is more reliance or more, more help from the French is going to be really, really important here, especially when it comes to the Navy, because America basically doesn't have a militarized Navy and the British have the best in the world by far. Um, but they have a, again, a, a professional, large professional army where the Americans don't really have such a thing. I mean, Washington is trying to kind of, put one together remember these are ordinary people they're not professionally trained soldiers so it's really not surprising the fact that the americans are losing these battles um early on here but of course they're gaining more experience and uh, things like that but again the longer the war goes on possibly the worse this becomes as a pr kind of thing for the british so we'll see that i will right, definitely do a part two or watch the part two episode um, if you like this, make sure to like and subscribe for more more videos. Again, be sure to visit the original video, and I'll make sure to leave a link there so you can give them your likes and subscriptions if you have not done so to make sure these content providers, the oversimplified people, do such a great job. And you can see this one provide a lot more humor and there's definitely some funny things to look at, but uh, it was a great video. So I'm looking forward to part two. Stay tuned for that, and we'll see you guys next time.